They told me that I came down here to help them to put up a or pipe in a eighty thousand barrel tank. And he said I never went back on. He stayed in Daisy Bradford's barn. They had converted it into a boarding house. And uh, but I remember him telling tales and talking to me about the big inch when I was a little boy. And uh, I knew about the big inch. Um, I don't know whether y'all realize it or not, but that is one of the lost histories of East Texas. Uh, there's a lot that people don't know about. And actually, when the Big Inch was being put in and planned, it was top secret. I'm going to share with y'all some things about the Big Inch and what accumulated of what began to come about to create the Big Inch. Now, the Daisy Bradford number three blew in on October the 3rd, 1930. It started a rush here at the time. If you know what 1930 was, what was going on in 1930? The Great Depression. People were out of work. There was 25% of the nation that was unemployed. Now that were men. The women weren't unemployed. If you know, the women worked at home. So uh, that was men. And everybody came from all over the world, actually, to East Texas to get a job. And uh, when the Lou Della Creme blew in on December the 27th of 1930, Kilgore grew. Now, I like to say that all this wasn't just happenstance. I like to say that this was all God's providence. In 1930, now, everything had to come about, and if you've ever worked in this old field like I have, it's amazing how they ever produced it. Can y'all hear me okay? All right back there? So, uh, anyway, I like to say it's God's providence. 1930, the oil was coming out of the ground and the rain was coming out of the sky. And everything was muddy around here. So it took that long to get everything to settle down. Now everybody knows what happened in 1941, December the 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor. Do you know they're not teaching that in school anymore? We have school kids that come to our museum and they do not know what happened December the 7th, 1941. But anyway, Pearl Harbor. Prior to Pearl Harbor, Believe it or not, we were selling oil to Germany and Japan. And uh, when Japan attacked us on December the 7th of 1941, we shut them off. Early on, our intelligence showed that Germany and Japan was running out of fuel, especially Germany. And uh, Hitler was trying to buy time. Now, believe it or not, here in East Texas, we didn't have any major refineries. You know where the first oil was discovered in America? Pennsylvania. Titusville, Pennsylvania, in 1859. All the big refineries were in the Northeast, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York. And uh, so we had more oil than the combined Axis powers had. Hey. But we had a problem. How was we going to get that oil to the Northeast? Now, uh, we had some small refiners here in East Texas. There was four or five. And, uh, but they did not have the capacity to refine enough fuel for the war effort. So in the very beginning, what we were doing is we were putting it on rail cars an 8-inch pipe was a standard pipe at that time. That was the largest that we could get. And they was pipelining it to Houston. They were putting it on rail cars and sending it down there. They was even trucking it down there, and they were putting it on tankers. And they were going out the Houston Ship Channel into the Gulf and going around Florida up the East Coast to get the oil to the big refineries in the Northeast. 
Now, in February, I think it was February, the, uh, I'm going to have to get my notes out. I think it was February 1942. Look at my notes. We were attacked at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. February of 42 was the first tanker that was sunk in the Atlantic. And uh, by a German U-boat. Now Hitler realized that we had more fuel and he sent his U-boats over here. The wolf packs as they call it. And they started sinking our ships. In the first five months we were in the war, they sunk 171 on the East Coast and 63 in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, to give you a little background on this, Hitler sent them over here, but he didn't have, have any communication with them. He didn't know where they were at. And at that time, our coasts were guarded by the U.S. Coast Guard as it is today, but our Coast Guard had pre-World War I technology. They had no way of finding out where these submarines were at. So they had free run. Uh, we uh, have found later we captured the U-66 German submarine. And you know what we found on that submarine? We found Campbell's soup. Unopened cans of Campbell's soup. We also found tickets to a movie theater in New Orleans. Now these Germans were coming up at night, getting coming up surfacing right off the coast, getting on their life boats and coming into our coast and buying goods. Believe it or not, we had Americans that were helping them. Central America was kind of helping the center and giving them fuel. They had to have fuel, so they were getting fuel. Uh, I had a man one day that I was giving a tour at the museum, and, and he said, when I was a boy, I lived in High Island, Louisiana. And he said, we seen the Germans at night come in and buy goods. He said, and they were real friendly. I said, well, they didn't have much choice, did they? He said, no, they didn't. But that was a eye-to-eye -eye or first-hand account. So, what were we to do in the first five months? Well, Harold Eckes was the Secretary of Interior under Roosevelt. And Roosevelt appointed him uh, as a council or uh, I never can get this right. He appointed him as a coordinator, petroleum coordinator for um, our uh, national defense. And Harold Eggies met with Roosevelt in 1940. And he told, and then again in 1941, he met with the Congress, Congress and uh, this is what he said to Roosevelt. I made very clear my belief that under normal peacetime conditions, the building of a crude oil pipeline from Texas to the east might not be economically sound, but that in the event of an emergency, it might be absolutely necessary. Now, we had our biggest pipeline, or biggest pipe that was ever made, made to this time was 8 inch. And they took, it was all done by manpower. So uh, Harold Eckes had come up with the idea and done some research. And he said, we're going to build a 24 inch from Longview to the Northeast. Nothing had ever been done like this before. It was uh, the longest pipeline in the world. Whoever you talk to, it's anywhere from 1,350 miles to 1,450 miles. And 
They said, they laughed at him and said, you can't do it. Now, the funny thing about it, do you know we had lobbyists back then? The timber lobby had went in and said, we want to do it out of trees. We're going to hollow out trees. And we'll build a pipeline out of trees. Can you imagine a pipeline made out of wood? Well, they rejected that. Then the cement lobbyists lobbied Congress and said, we want to build this pipeline out of concrete. Well, they'd done some research and development and realized it would take more rebar, steel rebar, to build this concrete pipe than it would to build a pipe out of steel. So uh, they rejected that idea. Now, one of the things that was uh, troublesome was the steel and the manpower. The manpower was that every able-bodied man was going off to war. So uh, they had to get men together, 15,500. Now that was combined workforce to build both lines. You've heard of the little inch. <coughs> Some us old East Texans, we call it the little inch. Most everybody else says the little big inch. But it was a 20 inch line that came from Beaumont. And it was a product line. They had done some research on this and they said it would be easier to build a crude line and then go back later and build the product line out of 20 inch now. The reason they made a 20 inch line for product was because it was easier, it went faster, it was lighter than the crude, and uh, they could get about as much volume through that 20 inch as with the 24. So anyway, they did the research and another thing that was a precious commodity, steel. All the steel was going for the war effort building the war machine. So they had a problem. They first, in uh, 1941, I believe it was, let's see if I can find my notes, they lobbied or tried to get the first application made to the SPAB, which was the Supply, Priority, and Allocation Board. July the 17th, 1944, 41 was the first application made for the steel allocation to build the 24 inch. July the 22nd, it was denied that same year. Discussions went on. They had got all the 11 major oil companies together to decide. Also, it was Standard, Standard Oil, Consolidated Oil Corporation, which I believe was Sinclair, Sun Oil Company, the Atlantic Refining Company, City Service Company, Sacconi Vacuum Oil Company. Does anybody know what Sacconi Vacuum was? You ever heard of Sacconi Vacuum? Magnolia. It was originally Sacconi Vacuum, which became mobile. Tidewater Associated Oil Company. Those are the uh, major oil companies that met and uh, decided on recommendations to build at 24 inch. Now, in the very beginning, they, just, they thought, well, we could lay a line across the top of Florida and let the ships come in there and move it on up the East Coast. That was quickly uh, rejected. But the recommendation is for a 24-inch crude pipeline to carry 250,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, May the 16th of 1941, an engineering subcommittee assigned to conduct a aerial surveys. They did this all by, the, by air and recommended a route for the big inch. Now, at that day and time, they did not get any easements. 
Um, patriotism was very high, and um, people just let them have the land to go through there. Actually, people even moved out of their houses so they could dig through their house and uh, put this line in. But anyway, um, May the 28th, 1941, Secretary Harold Eckes was appointed by President Roosevelt as Petroleum Coordinator for the National Defense. All the big oil companies assembled together for meetings. Um, and like I said, the timber lobby got involved and also the cement lobby got involved. And uh, the pipeline went, is referred to as National Defense Pipeline, later changed to War Emergency Pipeline, or WEP. So uh, they were denied in July for an application for the steel, to allocate the steel for the pipeline. And they met again on September the 5th, 1941. September the 15th, 1941. Application filed for steel priority to SPAB. Secretary Eckes met with Congressional Committee. October the 2nd, 1941 application was denied. December the 5th, 1941, the agreement of September the 5th, which was 11 major oil companies signed an agreement to privately finance the WEP. And in December the 5th, which was approximately five or three months of 1941, agreement of September the 5th expires by limitation. So that agreement had expired. Now, that was set December the 5th, 1941. Two days later, we were attacked. December the 8th of 1944, 41, first meeting of Petroleum Industry Council for National Defense. It was later changed to Petroleum Industry War Council. February, as I told you earlier, February the 1942, the first tanker was sunk in the Atlantic by the German U-boats. In March of that same year, 1942, submarine menace reaches acute stage. German U-boats ultimately sunk well over 150, as I told you, 171 on the East Coast, 63 in the Gulf. Um, at the time of these attacks, our Gulf Coast and Atlantic, as I, I told you before, was patrolled by our um, Coast Guard, which had pre World War I technology, so they could not find these boats, these submarines. Now, it came together in August of 1942. Actually, the first joint was laid in Little Rock, Arkansas, August the 3rd of 1942. To 15,500 men, they started hand digging ditch, three foot wide, four foot deep. Now, all the equipment that you see today on pipeline was a lot of it was designed and developed during this time because we had manpower and most all the pipe was picked up by men. Now, they had tongs that they would pick this pipe up and move it. Couldn't do that with 24 inch. So they had to come up with something. Now. For my, I had a, a lady that was at the museum one day, and she said her grandfather developed the side boom. Y'all know what a side boom is? It's a bulldozer with a boom on the side of it with a winch. I know y'all have seen them. If you... Well, that was developed for this purpose. Also, um, the paddle wheel ditching machine. You ever seen one of them? It's the round wheels, got teeth on it, the cup, and it digs the ditch. That was also developed during that time. Things that we still use today. Um, but anyway, people got together and they started coming up with good ideas. So the first joint was laid August the 3rd of 1942. 
they got finished with this pipeline 13 months later in the latter part of August. They laid 1,350 miles of 24 inch in 13 months. An accomplishment that never had been done before. And uh, the longest pipeline in the world. And we got her done. It's, oh, what's his name? What is his name? <laughs> Yeah, the cable guy. Larry the cable guy. Get her done, but we got her done. We were at the peak. We were sending 300,000 barrels a day to the northeast from this field, from the East Texas field alone. Now, long you ought to be proud that they were part of it. And uh, the men that served that time. Now I, my grandfather used to say that he never did go to war, but he was here and he put his part in because he kept the supply of oil going. Um, some notes. Hitler knew that Germany would run short of fuel. He had his chemist and his physicists desperately trying to come up with a synthetic fuel. Because he knew if he didn't have the fuel supply, he wasn't going to win the war. And uh, he sent his U-boats over here to try to buy himself some time. But it didn't work. And as I said before, we captured U-boat number 66. And we found the Campbell suit and also the New Orleans theater tickets in that submarine. It was also ultimately discovered that Center America factions had been providing supplies, fuel, and other items to the German U-boats, as Germany could not possibly communicate. On April the 7th of 1942, oil companies agreed to go ahead with both the 20 and 24-inch pipeline with priority on the 24-inch line. June the 10th of 1942, allocations for 137,500 tons of steel for the first section of the 24 inch pipeline approved. This was in June of 1942. $35 million budgeted approved for the first section of the 24 inch pipeline to run from Longview, Texas to Southern Illinois. Now it went to um, can you remember the, see what was the name of that, Illinois? North City. North City, I never can remember North City. That's where it went at first. They had 10,000 rail cars sitting there waiting to be loaded to go to the Northeast because they didn't know if they were going to have enough time to get the rest of the leg built. Um, oil companies agreed and made com commitments to supply the manpower and project leadership to construct the 2040. Uh, there was a lot of things. It was trial and error. In December or November of 1942, the Mississippi River and the Arkansas River flooded. Uh, it broke the moorings of the barges that was laying the pipe across. The Arkansas River was the worst. There was it took them two days to gather up the pipe that had washed down the river. Now, I would like to ask you this. It took them 13 months to lay this pipeline. What would we be doing today in 13 months? <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't there be uh, environmental impact studies? and, and uh, feasibility studies done. So uh, anyway, they had to go in and make an eight mile loop around the Arkansas River. It took them eight days, or two days, I'm sorry. And uh, they did go back and they put a double in case one of them double crossing and on all the major rivers. And, uh, but I think it's kind of funny 
that there was seven miles of pipeline pipe dug out of the river of Arkansas River and it was laying in the streets of Little Rock, Arkansas. Nobody ever thought anything about it today. The people of Ark Little Rock would probably be screaming, get this nasty pipe out of our streets. But anyway, it took 12,000 carloads of pipe and other materials received at approximately 200 unloading points. On February the 19th through June the 30th, a total of more than 21,000 barrels of crude oil were delivered at the North City Terminal. And from there it went on. Now, they had talked about railing this or putting on rail cars and going to the Northeast, and they figured it would take about 25,000 rail cars to get enough oil and supply up there. Um, As I said earlier, the big inch is approximately 1,350 to 1,450 miles long, depending on who you talk to. It is constructed of 24 inch seamless pipe, which had never been, they got the uh, research and they developed this pipe, never had been done before, weighing 100 pounds per foot. or 250 tons per mile. Total big inch pipeline requirement, approximately 360,000 tons of 24 inch seamless steel pipe. Oil moves through the pipeline at approximately 100 miles a day. Trip from East Texas to East Coast requires approximately 13 days. When it left Longview, it went, it took approximately 13 days to get to the northeast. The big inch crosses 13 principal streams, rivers, and 200 small streams. The big inch pipeline will deliver 300,000 barrels of oil per day operating at capacity. There was, uh, it requires 4 million barrels to fill. Now, we take oil and we take gasoline for granted today. I'm going to throw some figures out here that will astonish you, astonish me. Y'all know what the World War II vintage Sherman tank was? Battle tank? I want y'all to take a guess. How far would that tank travel? A hundred miles. How many gallons of fuel would it take for that tank to travel a hundred miles? I know you know. <laughs> Anybody want to guess? Ten oh. gallons per mile. How much? Ten gallons per mile. <laughs> no. You're pretty Ten close. <laughs> Ten thousand gallons to go a hundred miles. That's mind boggling. I had a guy ask me one day, he said, how in the world are they refueling tanks? I said, they had a fuel truck that followed along. A B-17 bomber, you know how long, many gallons of fuel it would take for it to stay in the air for one hour? I know you know. <laughs> Do you know? How many? 450. 450 gallons. Now, we like to tell the kids at the museum, do you know how far an aircraft carrier of World War II could go on a gallon of diesel? They were all diesel fired. Well, in reality, it wouldn't even fire it. It wouldn't even get it started. But it would go about that far. Now, to put in perspective how much fuel was needed. Uh, some of you in here probably remember the or the rate proration or rationing gasoline and uh, they did that because we were losing so much fuel on the east coast all the fuel that was getting to the east coast washing up on the beaches of South Carolina North Carolina and Virginia 
There's with people saying they could go out at night and read the newspaper by the fires that were burning off those tankers that were on fire out there in the, in the Atlantic. So uh, it took a lot of fuel. It took a lot of fuel. We don't understand or don't realize how much fuel it took for the war effort. Now I would like to say this. Without this East Texas field and without God's providence, and without this big inch, we'd all probably be speaking a different language today. German or Japan, Japanese. H.L. Hunt made the comment that the Allies floated to victory on a sea of East Texas crude oil. Any questions? Anybody have a question? Yes, ma'am. Who built the 24-inch pipe? Where did the steel... Where was this steel pipe made? Uh, one of the big ones, and I thought I had it here, was um, some would say that Lone Star Steel built some of it. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Tube Company built the majority of it. And... Um, I thought I had it down here. I knew that would be a question I couldn't answer. But it was a tube company out of the north. Now, all these companies came together and worked together. There were several different steel companies that built the pipe, but the major one was... Do uh, you remember, Steve? No, actually. I know it's in the notes. Is it in the notes? I can't remember where it's I thought you... I thought, he had, I thought I had it in the notes. I don't have it. Does someone else have a question? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, so I'm from New Jersey. I don't know any of this stuff. And you said you got oil in Kilgore, and that's where these things blew up. So why would you, you, you just say there was Daisy blowing? Oh, 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 oh. The Daisy Bradford is about 14 miles south of Kilgore. Okay, so why would you have the pipeline all the way up here in Longview? Because, uh, well, they had, uh, we've got a pipeline company out here, it's called Mid Valley. And they had storage tanks. And all the oil from the south end came up here. The, oil, the pipeline companies at that time would make what they call gathering systems. And they would bring all this into one, lateral lines into one line. And they brought it up here to Mid Valley, which is east of Longview out here. It's still in existence. And that's where they stored and brought the, the, the oil 